Let's uh, let's have a big round of applause for our teacher, uh, Earl Palmer. We've uh, really Oh, thank you, sir. No, I have I have to turn it on. I almost forgot. I got it. I got it. He's doing it. Boy, this is. I feel like I. I am on. on they did it. You know, I am so embarrassed, and I want to apologize that this was left up from last night because that means that when Craig Barnes, our beloved president, was speaking, it's saying deceive or deceiver right here. I, I just think, I think it's just awful. And that was left over from the night. I never do that. I always put this away because I never want. Isn't it? At least it wasn't catastrophe, was it? But that would have been there. But now, poor Greg, but he just assured me that he can cut all that out when he makes the film. <laughs> but isn't that awful? I mean, that it just shows you, you never know. Uh, the president really deserves respect, you know, and here, Plano. I don't want anybody to say that I was, uh, that I put that up for my beloved president. I, I, wasn't that a great session? Yeah. Yeah. It was a wonderful session with Michael Danham. And uh, and then Craig Barnes, I just didn't. and then you who uh, shared. I do want to say a couple of things. Uh, you got a, a copy of our newsletter that we do uh, that was in your folder, and if you want to be on our mailing list, you, you don't automatically get on our mailing list by coming to something we do. But if you want to get, uh, hear more about things we're doing, you know, in the Earl Palmer Ministry, we don't publish that ma newsletter that often. But it does show, and if you notice, the reason I put it in is it had the Princeton thing, uh, our Princeton class was in that newsletter. Uh, one other thing I am doing that may be interesting to you that I, this is the only ad I'll give, is that uh, for several summers, uh, the C.S. Lewis Foundation has asked me to do uh, a, two, uh, a week of, we called it, uh, it's not called seminar in Oxford, but it's called the uh, C.S. Lewis Oxford Week, and it's an Oxford Week at Lewis's house, the Kilns, and I have a, a great friend who's my sidekick, Kim Gilnett from Seattle Pacific University, and the two of us do it. It's limited to 12 people, and we, uh, and uh, it's uh, put on by C.S. Lewis Foundation, and I've done it a couple of years, I, and there's a picture in the newsletter from last year where we were over at Cambridge, but we go and spend one week at uh, Lewis's house you, st you as a participant stay in a bed and breakfast that we arrange for near the house and we pick you up every day, bring you to his house. We have the class actually in the study at the kilns, the house where Lewis lived and where he died. And, that, uh, and then on one day we go to Cambridge because Lewis c completed his career in Cambridge. And it's one week long, it's seven days, and it's done through C.S. Lewis Foundation and you have to make your reservation through C.S. Lewis Foundation uh, uh, and uh, you'd have to look them up. I, that's not on the newsletter. But uh, uh, I'm doing it again this summer. In July, uh, two separate weeks. One week, and then I repeat it, the same class, the next week. Since there are only 12 people that can come, and, and we do usually fill it up, but I wanted to give you first crack at it, uh, <laughs> because you have been so much fun to be with you here. That if, you, if that is something you want to do, uh, and it's under the auspices of C.S. Lewis Foundation. You can look them up on a website, and then they register you and all. But it was uh, so great to be here, or to be invited, to be able to do this with you and to have. We, my wife and I, Shirley, have just been marveling at the amazing gift that you have been to us. Uh, the chance we've had to visit with you and to talk with you, and to see the, all the worlds uh, of, of Christian ministry that are represented in this room. Uh, Michael and, and then Junior from uh, National was here. We, we talked about that the other night. The people we've met. And, and uh, this one man that goes to Cuba all the time and brought me a cigar because that's where he does his ministry. Imagine, and then I, a, a pastor from Puerto Rico. And then uh, a, a young deacon who is from the Philippines, a Roman Catholic who came as a, a deacon, and, and, and he used to live near where I lived in Manila. Uh, and he's here. And then pastors from all over the, uh, the United States. 
and Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist. It's just the most marvelous mixture of brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want to thank you. And you have been such a joy. And you sit in the same seats every day. I like that. <laughs> These are your seats. I made it so You know something funny? I, I came to Princeton in 1953 and went to Miller Chapel, very faithfully, naturally. And I walked to the left and down to about the seventh row from the front. And that's where I sat my first day at Miller. I never sat anywhere else in the entire time I was a student at Miller. I never sat on the right side of the Miller Chapel. Never in the balcony, always the seventh row. And then I graduated in 56. I became a trustee in the 1970s. In fact, I was a trustee here for over 35 years. And uh, Jim McCord was our president. And of course, where do I sit when I go to the trustees? We always go to chapel. I sit in the same seat. Isn't that funny? We are, we are all slaves to, our brain just simply goes to where we plan to go. And here you folks, you got a seat, and I notice you all have been sticking in your same seat. And I have, Steve has sat right there the whole time. I am so glad. Now you guys have moved. You, you started back there. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you, you know, I was pastor for uh, pastor for 19 years at the University of Presbyterian Church, in Seattle, and it's a big church. Believe me, I had five services. Can you believe it? I preached the same sermon five times every Sunday, and I did that for about 16 years because we had to start some evening services because of, of we only hold 1,200 people in the sanctuary, and rather than to build a bigger sanctuary. Uh, I said, let's just have more services. And, uh, and, it w and then we did it. We had three in the morning with the great cathedral choir, and then in the evening, two with our music team. And so we had a con more contemporary musical uh, 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 liturgy in the evening, and in the morning, the more traditional. And I loved it. I loved both. And, uh, and then people did say I gathered momentum as the day went on. <laughs> because the two evening ones were 5 o'clock and 7. And the reason we were able to get people to come in the evening is we had a full Sunday school at 5 o'clock. And they called it a kids club, but it was a full Sunday school. And so we got families that came. Uh, Seattleers loved to ski in the winter, so they could go skiing up at the local ski area and could come to church and be there at 5 o'clock. So it was all right. So we, get, we they didn't have to do to you know break the Sabbath. They could go and ski and then still come to church. But we had, uh, oh, it was a wonderful experience to have that. But I would meet people in the grocery store because in UPC we had a balcony and I can see everybody's face in UPC but I can't see the faces in the balcony because it's a little bit darker up there. And so uh, I didn't know those people necessarily. But I would meet people in the grocery store and they would say, y you don't know me but I know you. I'm, I'm, and then I, I say, well, uh, I go to your church. I say, oh wow. And I always said this, uh, what service do you go to? And they say, well I go to the th a third service. Where do you sit? Right. And I always ask that because people always sit in the same place. <laughs> and then I would start watching for them. And, uh, and then finally, the, 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 I, I did this so much and mentioned it, that people would now meet me and they would say this, you don't know me, but I know you because, and I'll, on an airplane, people will say, you don't know me, but I know you, I go to your church, and I'm in the third service that I sit in the fourth <laughs> Because I know I ask that question, where do you sit? And, uh, it, it, would, it turned out to be fun, and I still am emeritus now at UPC, but I still get to preach there. Every now and then, they still ask me to, uh, the emeritus, the beloved emeritus pastor gets to preach once in a while. And I get to preach, uh, uh, for the last four years, I've been preaching the last Sunday of, of December and the first Sunday of January. So I'm doing that again this year. You notice that on my notice, it says, come at, attend UPC on the 29th, uh, of, de of December and the first Sunday of, of January. So I do that, and that's, uh, and I, I try to, whatever they ask me to do, I try to do. But you know, I'm not a pastor in the church now, so, and I don't miss it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what I don't miss, <laughs> I don't miss, I don't miss, I'll tell you one thing I don't miss, I don't miss governance. I have no governance. And when I went to National for those two years in National, I said the one thing I'll come for two years is that I have no governance. I don't want to be in any governance. And I didn't, isn't this true? I never even attended the session 
for the two years I was at National. I was preaching pastor in residence. I just got to preach and serve the staff and the people. But I, and you know, by, because I didn't even attend session, nobody tried to triangulate with me. That is the best blessing in the church. Nobody came up and said, well, you talk to so-and-so, get them to do so-and-so. And of course, I'm sure people at National would never do that anyway. But nobody, <laughs> nobody ever did that with me because they knew I had no power. It's wonderful to be powerless. You know? And that's one nice thing about re being honorably retired. You're powerless, and you don't have to be that uh, governance role. Because, uh, you know, it, you can see I was, the, I was in charge of too many things. You know? I, was, I was the senior pastor. Uh, but I did it. I'm grateful. I did it in Berkeley for 21 years. I did it in Manila as a solo pastor in Manila at the Union Church. I loved it. But, you know, now I kind of do this Earl Palmer ministry and do these things and, and serve the church, but I don't have to have empowerment. And that has been wonderful. I have a text for you for our final time. And, you know, being uh, so proper in this, I decided to show you how different translations handle this text. It's not so spectacular. Uh, difference like the uh, Second Thessalonians uh, 3.1 it was kind of fun because there's some major word, the word, uh, dynamic words that needed to be, see how Moffat would handle that word. And uh, how did he handle that, that marvelous uh, trexo, you know, run? And how did uh, the King James Bible handle it? And how did the, uh, uh, did J uh, Eugene Peterson handle it? How did the new RSV? It isn't uh, so interesting in this text, except I didn't show you that this text that I'm now going to show you is about the, uh, a parable Jesus taught on the Monday of Holy Week. I, I love this. He came in on the Monday of Holy Week. Everybody is churned up on the Monday of Holy Week, especially in Jerusalem, because of the great crowd of people that showed up on Palm Sunday. Uh, according to John's Gospel, one of the big reasons for the huge crowd was a rumor had spread about the raising of Lazarus. Only John's Gospel tells us that about the raising of Lazarus. That rumor had spread, and so many people were there for that. Uh, otherwise, it's just that this is the, the most famous moment in our Lord's ministry. And he came down uh, and entered the city and great crowds. And the people threw things on the ground, and they put palm branches down. We're told that uh, in, the, in the book of John, they put palm branches down, which would have been a big alert to any Roman CIA agent. Uh, because if the, you know the, the crest of Judas Maccabees, who was the great revolutionary, and you know CIA agents are very interested, Central Intelligence, are very interested in revolutionaries. And the revolutionary in Jewish history was Judas Maccabees, who uh, led the revolution uh, in, against, the, uh, against the Seleucids, against the Syrians, the Seleucids. And got a kind of independence for, for about 90 years. The Jews had about 90 years of independence after that Judas Maccabees revolt. It's celebrated by Hanukkah. The, the Feast of Hanukkah celebrates that Judas Maccabees revolt. And Judas Maccabees had a crest, and the crest of Judas Maccabees was a palm branch. Did you know that? So any uh, CIA agent would be really suspicious if they saw palm branches being put down for this man coming in on the donkey. Do they think he's another Judas Maccabees? Is here another revolutionary coming into town? And maybe that would scare the religious establishment too, the Sadducees, not the Pharisees, because the Pharisees were the Judas Maccabees crowd. They were the young terrorists, so to speak, or the freedom fighters that won that independence. Sadducees were the high priesthood. But they would be very troubled uh, because of that. So we know that on the Monday of Holy Week, people are troubled. They're very upset. And arguments begin to spread. And I'm not going to read those to you now, but you can see them in chapter 21 of Matthew. Arguments are spread. And the arguments began to be spread about John the Baptist. Because again, John the Baptist was kind of a revolutionary type figure that was scary uh, to a lot of people. Scary, obviously, to Herod. But uh, they're, they're arguing about what kind of a teacher John the Baptist was, and what about Jesus Christ? And does Jesus Christ, this one who comes in, does he have authority and all that? And so arguments are raging. 
between Pharisees, they're in the argument, with Sadducees, they're in the argument too, and they're arguing about John the Baptist and Christ, and Jesus, and what kind of authority he has. And anyway, in that context, there comes this little moment where Jesus tells a parable. And here's the parable. The parable is, I'm giving you the four renderings of the parable in the four translations, the new RSV, King James, Jerusalem Bible, that's a great Roman Catholic edition, and then the message by Eugene Peterson. Uh, I have to tell you right away, though, that two manuscripts that are current manuscripts that are in your hands, the New English Bible, and also one of the Roman Catholic editions called the New American Bible, reverse the two boys in this parable. They have the boy who says no uh, uh, and the boy who says yes are reversed from what we have here. But the great majority of manuscripts have the order that we have here. So I didn't bother you by putting in either the New English Bible or the New American Bible that has them reversed. The story is the same completely except the two boys are reversed. And that's because uh, several manuscripts uh, did that. Uh, uh, but Codex Sinaiticus, which became sort of the main manuscript to test, because it's the oldest, that when it was, see, the King James Bible didn't have Codex Sinaiticus, but they used Codex Sinaiticus to be a corrective in a lot of translation work. Codex Sinaiticus has this order, and so this order is the preferred order. That's why the new RSV, when Bruce Metzger from Princeton was the great editor of the new RSV, he put it in the order like the Sinaiticus had it. The King James Bible had it in this order because that was Vaticanus. That manuscript had it this way, but other manuscripts had it in another order. So I did not bother you by, but yeah, I, it, if you're preaching in your church and you're new, using the New English Bible, you're going to have the boys in two different orders. Okay, but now let's see it. Here it is. What do you think a man had two sons? He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not, but later he changed his mind and went. The father then went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Now that's the parable. It's a very short parable. Uh, it's not the famous two sons parable. <laughs> the famous one is the parable of the prodigal son, the elder brother. This is the non-famous two sons parable. <laughs> but, and you know, think of the parables of Jesus. Some of his parables, he tells the parable and just leaves it there with you with no comment whatsoever. It kind of leaves it for you to work with. <laughs> like St. Paul said to Timothy, you think it over, you figure it out. You, you're smart enough, you can do it. Sometimes Jesus will interpret the parable. That's rarer. He does that with the soils. He actually interprets the parable and says, this is what those different kinds of soils represent. Sometimes he will ask a question of his listeners. And those are the ones we love the best, like the parable of the Good Samaritan. He asks a question of the young lawyer, who proved neighbor to the man who fell among thieves? And the man gets the right answer. So he, that's Luke 10. He interprets the parable. I mean, he asks the question of the listener to interpret the parable. He lets the, the listener interpret the parable, and then he comments. And this is that, that third kind, all right. So he then asks a question. Uh, Jesus said, which of the two did the will of the Father? He gives you a clue then as to what he thinks the parable is about, the will of the Father, uh, the decision of the Father. And they said, and notice, they get to interpret the parable, the first. Now, if you're using the ASV, it'll say the second because they reversed the order of the two boys. But the first. And then Jesus said, amen, or truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. They're ahead of you going in. Uh, he isn't saying that you're not going in, but they're ahead. For John came to you, see John the Baptist, who they've been arguing about, came to you in the way of righteousness. You did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. By the way, notice you're getting now our Lord using one word over and over again. Always be alert to when Jesus uses a word over and over again. It gives you a clue as to what means the most to him in this pair. You did not believe, they believed him. And even after you saw it. Now that is a good question. And I'm going to show you that the translators are wondering what he means by what he, you saw it. You did not then change your minds and believe him. All right? 
Now, the other translations are interesting. The King James Bible is basically the same. What do you think? What think ye? A certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go work in, uh, today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented. Now, notice, uh, he used, uh, the King James used a, di a different word. There are two slight variations on this word, and he uses the word repent. Uh, and the, many of the translations say repent. Actually, the word is change his mind. So the RSV is correct. It's a little different. Changes his mind. Meta, still meta is there, but his mind was changing. He, he, thought, he thought about it and changed his mind. All right? <laughs> the King James said, he just said, he repented. And went. And so he went the second. Likewise, he answered, I go, sir. He did not. Or he went not. Whither of the two twain did the will of the Father? They said to him, the first. Notice, they get the right answer again. Jesus said, amen, verily. Verily is, or truly, uh, the, 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 the manuscript is amen. When Jesus, when things are translated verily, verily, it's usually amen, amen. It's a Hebrew word that Jesus uses. Amen is the Hebrew word for rock, for sure pig, for faithful. So it's when it's used twice, and then it means Faithful, like Paul uses it twice, amen, amen, uh, in the beginning of Romans, uh, it means God's faithfulness for our faith. See, this is faithful. Well, when Jesus does it in the beginning of a parable, amen, amen, I tell you, he say, or verily, verily, it's this is faithful, you can put your weight on it. See, you can trust it. Double use of faithful. Amen, amen, means faithful, put your faith on it. Or just by itself, faithful. So, amen. Uh, I say to you, the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom before you. They're coming in ahead of you. John came to you in the way of righteousness. And notice uh, that's the same way as the, king, as the RSV says, the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. The publicans and harlots believed him, and ye, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. Jerusalem Bible d does some interesting things with a couple of those ideas. What is your opinion? See, what think ye? That's a good way of putting it. A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, My boy, will you go and work in the vineyard today? He answered, I will not go. But afterwards he, now notice, they realize that the word repent is a different word. And they, uh, the second answered, uh, no, the first boy, but afterward he thought better. He thought better of it. In other words, he changed his mind. Just like the new, the, uh, new RSV says, changed his mind. He changed his mind. He thought better of it and went. The man then uh, went and said to the second, the same thing to the second, and who answered, certainly, sir. Uh, yeah, I want to work with that a little bit because did you know that the Greek text for uh, I go, sir, that the RSV said, and now the king, the Jerusalem picks that up too. Certainly, sir. You know why they do it that way? Because the actual word that's used there is the word kuria, Lord. The son says, I go, Lord. The first boy doesn't say that. He says, I will not go. The second boy says, I go, Lord. And in in the in, in sense of this religious context of all this, he uses kuria, the strongest word possible of honor to use to the father. You wouldn't ordinarily call your father Lord, you see. But notice, that's in the text. I go, Lord Jesus pours it on. And so the, notice how the Jerusalem Bible caught that. Certainly, sir, see, I go, Lord. But he did not go. Which of the two did the father's will? The first, said Jesus, they, and they again get the right answer. Then he says, I tell you solemnly, Tax collectors and prostitutes will make their way. That's how he's handling amen. See, solemnly, amen. This is faithful. I'm going to faithfully tell you this. Uh, the tax collectors and prostitutes are making their way. And I like the way that Jerusalem puts it. Are making their way into the kingdom of God before you. Now notice, kingdom of God is used by Jerusalem Bible. Uh, again here, in the kingdom of God. They're coming in to the kingdom of God. Uh, before you. For John came to you a pattern of true righteousness. What he taught was toward righteousness. 
and but you did not believe him. Now notice again the three uh, the threefold use of believing in. Yet the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And now I'm sorry that Jerusalem doesn't repeat the word believe to show the emphasis that's in the Greek text. Did believe him. In the RSV that is preserved. Believe, believe, believe which shows you how important that word is for Jesus in this parable. Did believe, and even after seeing that, you refuse to think better of it and believe him. And then Eugene Peterson is always a little bit outlandish, but he's fun to read. I love Eugene Peterson. Tell me what you think of this story. You know, that's a good way to start a parable, see? That's what Jesus is doing, is giving a very short story. You know, it's so short, it's only two lines. But tell me what you think of this story. A man had two sons. He went up to the first and said, Son, go out for the day and work in the vineyard. And the son answered, I don't want to. (laughs) And I don't want to. He wants to show, I will not. See, this is this tremendous, uh, I'm sick and tired of this vineyard. I don't want to, he says. And later on, and John and Peterson realizes that repent's probably not the right word. Later on, he thought better of it. See, he thought better of it and went. He changed his mind. The father gave the same command to the second son. And it's interesting, Peterson wants to see that the father didn't treat the two boys differently. Because he didn't treat them differently and say a different sentence to the second son. And he, so he, uh, the father gave the same command to the second son, and he answered, Now notice how he handles, I go, Lord. Sure, glad to. See? <laughs> and I think that's kind of clever on Eugene Parter's, uh, Eugene's part. Ah, oh, not just dad, you're my Lord, dad. Sure, dad. I, I, yes, I want to. Glad to. But he never went. Uh, then which of the two sons did, the fa- did what the father asked? Again, uh, the RSV says did the will of the father, did the decision of the father, God's uh, holy will. That's the great word for will or God's decision. Uh, did, did what the father asked. And then he said the first. And then Jesus said yes. And I tell you, <laughs> and this is Gene again, <laughs> crooks and whores are going to precede you. He, they all catch this. They're not saying that you're not getting into the kingdom, maybe, but they're going on ahead. Look who you're going to meet when you go into the kingdom. <laughs> you're going to meet all the... Lewis has this great line in screw tape letters that when the, the patient first went to church and he saw they handed him a shiny little book that nobody could read very well. Lewis did not like the English songbook because they had tiny words. You couldn't read it very well. And a little shiny book they were handed, and then he saw and looked around the room and saw just the people he had been avoiding all week. <laughs> and they were in the church. <laughs> just the people he had been avoiding all week. Now, this will be what they're going to find when they see these people, the crooks, the ones I've been avoiding all week. I'm, they're ahead of me. And, but that's in the text. And so Eugene Peterson caught that. Uh, so he puts it this way. So John came showing you the right road. And you turned up your noses at him, but the crooks and the whores believed him. And, uh, and even when you saw their... Ch- now, here's how he... G- Eugene Peterson believes that I should show the effect of the people. And this is probably the crowd that came on Palm Sunday. See, is that what... Uh, the, even when you saw it, that the people responded, see? So that's how Eugene Peterson decides to handle this. When you saw their changed lives, when you saw that people, what was happening uh, with the people who then uh, repented and uh, John the Baptist and, and came to Christ, because remember John the Baptist pointed to Christ, and when you when they saw it, you didn't care enough to change your mind and believe. Okay, was that kind of interesting to see different texts? Uh, it wasn't as spectacular when major words are altered, but I wanted you to see that these texts, uh, the different translations will be able to catch hold of nuances that are in the text, and I just wanted you to see it in this great, this great passage. All right. Uh, this parable, this story, is a two-story parable. 
just like the, 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 the famous one of the, many parables are, are two-story or multi-story parables. Two different things are happening in the parable. So in, in the parables of Jesus, you have to watch and see what's happening in the story. And in this story, notice what makes it work. You have two boys, and each have a flaw. They're both flawed. The first son has the flaw of arrogance, and he too quickly opposes his father's will. He too quickly says no. Notice, I will not. And you know, vineyard for the Jews is a symbol of the people of God. It's a symbol of fulfillment. It's a symbol of the kingdom of God. That's how these translators see it. It is symbolic of the kingdom of God. So, uh, but the first son, too hastily, he too hastily opposes the father's will as if it were against him. And so he says, I will not. I don't want to. That's the way Peterson puts it. I don't want to. And uh, now that's a flaw. But later on, he changed his mind and went in. But at first, he said no. Okay. I'm going to say from a story standpoint, this boy is a big problem at breakfast to the family. <laughs> but he's a joy at supper. All right? But he's the guy that gets everybody upset at breakfast. Dad is just handing out the assignments. After all, these are assignments to make the vineyard work. We've got to make the vineyard work. We've got to get these grapes in, folks. Uh, I'd like you to go to, uh, over to Vineyard 5. I will not. I'm sick and tired of this vineyard. My feet are turning purple. I want to go out and have fun. With my, I mean, I'm, I'm a little overdoing it. But he said, I don't want to, according to James Peterson, or Eugene Peterson. And so he says, no, I, it's not what I want to do. He hastily opposes uh, what the family wants, what the family needs, and what the father says, the father's will, and uh, it, that's his flaw. He, it, arrogance and hasty rejection. Uh, but later on, he changes his mind and goes into the vineyard. Now, in all of the parables that Jesus teaches where two sons, usually the second part of the parable is more complicated. Remember in the prodigal son, that's quite simple. A prodigal boy goes off, wastes all the money, comes back, and the father meets. It's the elder son part of the parable of the prodigal son that is really the most, is the most complicated. Because he, I served you all these years. I never had a party. So. And yet, it's interesting, isn't it, in the parable of the prodigal son, that the most beautiful promise does not, there's the surprise in that parable, does not go to the first boy who went out and and was reckless and said no. Actually had death wish. Father, I wish you'd die so I could get my share of the, of the property. And the father says, okay, take the share of the property, which is like asking your father to die. And it's horrible. And yet he does get a ring put back in his hand and a party is put on because he was once dead and now is alive. But did you know the best promise goes to the elder son? The father goes out and finds him in the dark. He doesn't have to find the younger boy. The younger boy finds the father. He's running back. The father has good eyesight and sees him and runs and meets him, but he comes back. But then the best part is the second son, when the father goes out in the dark, I love this, and finds him. And did you listen to the sentence from the father? Son, everything I have is yours. He doesn't say that to the first boy. Everything I have is yours. But it was right that we had this party. He, your brother, see, he had not called him my brother. He said, this son of yours. Yeah. Your brother was dead. He's now alive. He was lost. He's now found. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You can see where that would hit a guy like uh, John Newton, and he would write amazing grace. But it's the elder brother that experienced that amazing grace, maybe more than the younger brother did. Everything I have is yours, son. And he went out and found that boy mad in the dark. So it's interesting, isn't it? The second part of the parable is, in some ways, more complicated. In this one, the father goes to the second son after the first son is stormed out of the house. Big problem at breakfast. He goes to the second son and says, <clears throat> uh, would you go uh, to uh, field number two? And he says, Dad, Lord, 
I was thinking, I'm going to pour it on a little bit. I was thinking, because that's how I think I go, sir. Yes, I'm glad to go. I was thinking this morning in quiet time, how wonderful it would be. He probably is very good. I was thinking this morning in quiet time, how wonderful it would be to go and work in the vineyard, because I know that we're working in the vineyard as the college fund to help everybody go to college. And, uh, and we as a family, the family that works together, stays together. And he probably has a lot of those euphemisms, these wonderful things. I'm not like some others who don't care about that. I do care about that, Father. Yes, Father, I can't wait to go. Mother, put on an extra egg for me because I can't wait to get a sweat up. I love to go. Now, that's, that would be my interpretation of, I go, sir. I can't wait. You know, there were people that wanted to follow Jesus that way, too, until he said, you know, foxes have holes. And the Son of Man does not have anywhere to lay his head. And then suddenly they pulled back. <laughs> I'm not sure I want that. But anyway, he said, I go, sir. Uh, but he did not. And, okay, I'll describe this boy. I give him credit for what he is. He is a joy at breakfast. Now, give him credit for that. He cheers the whole family up at breakfast because the first son has churned everybody up negatively. And now, I don't know if you have a son like that in your family. Were you that kind of a kid? But <laughs> he churns everybody up at breakfast. But this boy calms everybody down. He says, hey, don't worry. It's going to be great. I can't wait. And I'm stronger than the other guy anyway. I am going to get it all done. And he cheers everybody up at breakfast. But this is not a breakfast parable, it's a supper parable. He doesn't go. And so he's a big problem at supper. At supper, he's a big problem. And it is a supper parable. Not a, you have to always ask, what kind of parable do we have? This is a parable about where you actually end up. And so he doesn't go. And that means that it, uh, it's a very, very complicated parable in that regard. You've got the one boy who's uh, arrogant at the beginning but does go into the vineyard, and the other boy who says yes but doesn't. Now, what does the parable teach? I want to make three reflections on this parable, if I can. The first is it shows that Jesus understands human beings. And he understands... You know, sc many scholars have observed that the, the parables of Jesus are very... They're psychologically accurate. <coughs> And this parable is psychologically accurate. And uh, he understands human personalities. And notice one of the things that it shows he understands. It shows that he's not surprised that we might have a negative response or a negative first response to his kingly reign. Remember, kingdom of God language, I, I agree with Bonhoeffer, all of the kingdom of God language in the New Testament, that vineyard language, is about the kingly reign of Christ. The cost of discipleship is the reign of Christ. And we have a natural instinct sometimes to oppose that reign. It's, and Jesus shows that he's not surprised. He's not surprised about our uh, hesitancy. And, uh, and notice it doesn't bother him. That negative response does not bother him in the parable. Uh, it doesn't seem to bother the father. The father doesn't uh, run after the boy or scold the boy. He just says, would you go in the vineyard? He says, no. And the young man's agency is not tampered with. We talked about that before. That's not taken away. But Jesus shows that he is aware that some people uh, too hastily oppose the will of the Father. But it also shows that he's aware that some people too hastily agree with the Father. And maybe that is a reflection on sometimes a, a too easy a discipleship decision before you realize that foxes have holes and the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head, or that there is a cross that we're aiming toward, that he says, and, G and Peter said, it'll never happen. But it did happen. And so there is a too hasty, uh, quickly, a quick faith. So notice, that is also in the parable. By the way, the story's not over in each of these parables, and I'm glad that that's preserved. It doesn't say that the second boy never gets to the kingdom, but by that, uh, by not going, uh, he is uh, he has to follow others that, that do go. So, but the story's not over. But yet, the story is kind of sad here for that second son. He missed out in getting into the vineyard. He missed out at that point, at least. Though I'm grateful for the fact that 
all of us are mid-story in our lives. None of us are at the end of the story. Uh, we're all mid-story. And sometimes we're either of these two people, mid-story. But there it is. Now, the second thing that I think Jesus shows in the parable, and we see it especially with the first son, but I'm going to say it's also true for the second son, is that he preserves lag time. I call it lag time. He preserves a period of time from when you hear his command and when you do it. In fact, that is preserved at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, those who hear my words and do them are like the wise man who builds his house on a rock. And those who hear my words and don't do them are like the foolish man or woman who builds his house on sand. But notice there's a gap between hear and do. And Jesus preserves that gap. I made a little joke about it the other day with regard to behold, I stand at the door and knock. In the book of Revelation, there's a gap. There's a period, a lag time that is preserved. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, there is a period of time when you get to hear and then open. Hear, and, and that is preserved for every person. And it has to be preserved. The parable does preserve it. The boy said no, but then thought it over. Notice, he thought it over. And then there is this period of lag time. And our Lord in the parable does preserve it. It's even preserved for the boy that says, yes, I'll go, but doesn't go. There's a lag time still because will he finally go? We don't know. We don't know. Jesus shows no interest in why he doesn't go. Uh, but yet, that we can take hope from the fact that the others are going on ahead. That doesn't mean he isn't going to get there, but is, he doesn't get there then. He has not decided yet. But, uh, and thankfully, he's, he's mid-story. We don't know what's going to yet happen. But right now, uh, at this point, in the lag time, he's decided not, not to make a move. And so, but the lag time is preserved. And then the third reflection I would like to make is that Jesus shows that the gospel, the good news of his kingly reign, does wear well into the afternoon. It makes sense the more we think it over. I have a quote from C.S. Lewis that I do love. In the little book, Miracles, he, the greatest chapter in this book is his chapter on the grand miracle, where he tells about Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ pulls the pieces together and makes sense out of our lives. And, and, then, uh, and then we respond to him. And at the end of that chapter, Lewis says this, with this our sketch of the grand miracle may end. Its credibility does not lie in obviousness. And then he has four other world views. He says, uh, pessimism, optimism, <coughs> pantheism, that's the view that everything is God, materialism, all have this obvious attraction. Each is confirmed at first glance by multitudes of facts, but later on each meets insuperable obstacles. The doctrine of the incarnation, of the coming of Jesus Christ, works into our minds quite differently. It digs beneath the surface. It works through the rest of our knowledge by unexpected channels. And listen to what Lewis says here. It harmonizes best with our deepest apprehensions and our second thoughts. And in union with these, in fact, I, when I preach this sermon, I title it First and Second Thoughts. And in union with these, it undermines our superficial opinions. It has little to say to the man or woman who is still certain that everything is going to the dogs or that everything is getting better and better. There's your pessimist, there's your optimist. Or that everything is God, there's your pantheist. Or that everything is electricity, your materialist. And then he has this great final line. Its hour comes when these wholesale creeds have begun to fail us. And Lewis saw that. It happened in his own life. In a sense, maybe that's what happens to the first boy. I don't want to. The kingly reign of Christ <laughs> does not make sense to me now. But the more he thought about it, and in a way, you have to give people a chance to have that, that chance to think it over to wonder about it. And as he thought it over, it made sense. It made sense. 
it finally came together. And uh, you know, that's, I, I, would, I, I wanna say as a final thought on exposition, one of the things is if you can get the text into a person's life, in, in, into their hands, and they can be in a small group, say, and talk over a text like this, and at first, uh, uh, they may not fully understand all that it means, but the longer they live with it, it begins to make sense. And that vineyard begins to look better and better. And finally you'll say uh, something like my friend Champ Heilman said, when I dismiss Christ as an idea, he haunts me as a person. When I dismiss him as a person, he haunts me as an idea. And finally I realize, who would I rather trust than the Jesus of Nazareth that I met in the Bible? The one who fulfills the Old Testament Psalms and the one who, who is the one that the New Testament bears witness to. The Jesus Christ of history, he wins my respect. He wins my faith. And that may take time. And it takes time. And I'm glad that this parable, mind you, this is one of the last parables Jesus taught. It's a parable of the fact that it's gonna take time for you to figure this out. And he's willing, he's so sure of the truth that he's willing to take that time that it takes. Amen. Uh.